machines interact like people, and bodies can be rebuilt from scratch. How will we wage war, fuel our need for power, commute to space? What life-saving innovations will be possible in the next 50 years? Flying ambulances and intelligent clothing. Brain chips cure paralysis. Vile organs printed to order. See how scientists today are making visions of tomorrow real. Physicist and futurist Michio Kaku will guide you through the medical breakthroughs that will change your life. The future is closer than you think. It all starts now with the body. 50 years from now, you'll live in an intelligent house. You can program sensors to monitor your body and keep you healthy, yet guard your privacy. Caution, level. Because any information you reveal could come back to haunt you. Let's keep this between us. Computer chips connect you to the entire city, including your insurance company. The good news is you'll live a lot longer because an agent gives you a remote physical every three days. The bad news? You'll have no secrets. Wait, the mucous membrane of the mouth? Send health memo immediately. Bonjour, Monsieur Degas. Here are a few more tips for your dental care. Brush your teeth regularly using the ultrasound toothbrush. Which will give away the fact that Alan was partying last night and his premiums will go up as a result. Thanks for your attention. You must be joking. Get the car, please. Alan's clothing looks quite ordinary, but that's deceptive because woven inside the fabric are dozens of tiny computer chips and sensors monitoring his health. When he puts on his clothing, he goes online. Now get this, if he's ever knocked unconscious, his clothes will automatically identify his coordinates, alert the authorities, and upload his entire medical history before the ambulance arrives. In the future, you will have a doctor in your clothing. In 2057, your clothes will contain biomedical sensors connected to a global network. Engineer Sundaresan Jayaraman has already developed a prototype, a smart shirt. What the smart shirt technology has done is it has enabled the ultimate integration between sensing, communication, and clothing. Jayaraman's breakthrough was to use polyester-like fibers that are as conductive as wire. He's pioneered an ingenious technique to weave a fine grid of these fibers into the cloth. His method took years to perfect before he created a shirt both soft and washable. Wires and computer chips can disappear into the fabric. And sensors can be inserted at any point. Let's say I'm an athlete who's training for my Olympics or any particular sport, then I can monitor my heart rate, for instance, using this shirt. And so the information will go from there to this, there'll be a controller here, and from here the information will be transmitted to the uh, point where you want to collect the data. Tests have already begun. The shirt gives a complete readout of the athlete's heart rate and activity. Coaches can use such data to improve training. But in the future, intelligent clothing will do much more. The moment a soldier is hit, smart clothes will transmit the exact location of the wound and his vital signs. Smart clothes will monitor carbon monoxide levels for firemen. And they'll alert a hospital at the first signs of a heart attack. 50 years from now, everybody, from little babies to senior citizens, will be wearing this kind of clothing that can enhance the quality of life for them. And in fact, uh, if a person is involved in an accident, that can actually save their life. 
In 2057, your car pulls up on command to take you to work. Today, a three-story fall would probably kill you, but not in the future. In a split second, your clothes transmit the severity of your injury. Insurance status? Give clearance for ambulance. Initiate cause analysis. Alert hospital. Back. Yeah? Within one minute, help's on the way. It won't get stuck in traffic. It can land anywhere, and it's fast. As a kid, I used to watch Flash Gordon on TV and dream about having my own personal flying car. But you know, there are problems with that dream. Even for helicopters, they're bulky, expensive, and tricky to fly. And flying cars have always been problematic. But engineers are now solving those practical problems. And NASA scientists envision the day when we will look up and see a superhighway in the sky. Engineer Paul Muller has spent more than $75 million to build his dream. A good flying car is a vehicle that does a number of things. Takes off vertically like a helicopter, flies at high speed like an airplane, and drives for some distance on the road like an automobile. From the start, Muller set his sights on vertical takeoff. Very few people have airports in the backyard. So that's absolutely critical. He was up against some big challenges. Maintaining balance during vertical takeoff is near impossible for a human. No pilot can adjust engines on each side of the plane fast enough to keep it level. So Muller is developing highly complex software linked to flight sensors to do the job. The Harrier uses such software. But this warplane costs millions more than the $100,000 Muller hopes to charge for his sky car. And this isn't Muller's only challenge. To take off vertically, Muller needs engines that are powerful yet light. Instead of large aircraft engines, he's modified smaller engines called Wankels with just two moving parts. They power four propellers that tilt up to lift off and forward to fly. After decades of work, this is Muller Skycar. 700 horsepower, yet only 1,400 pounds. It's designed to fly at 300 miles per hour, but can it actually take off? It does. For now, the Sky Car remains safely tethered while Muller works out other kinks, like prop wash and noise. But within 20 years, he predicts police and rescue services will adopt his car. In 50 years, Muller expects half of all Americans will be airborne. Whether or not Moeller succeeds, advances will continue in engine technology, materials, and computer chips. Many engineers believe you'll see some kind of affordable air vehicle in the next 20 years. You'll fly to a nearby airport, pop it into car mode, and drive home. A lot of people get concerned because they've got this vision of all kinds of vehicles up in the air, but actually if you took all the cars on the road in America today and put them in the air, they'd still be miles apart. You'll see a computerized world where you're not flying it, you're just sitting, you're playing computer games, you're reading, uh, you're sleeping, doing whatever as you're delivered from point A to point B. In the future, flying ambulances will arrive 10 times faster. And on board, they'll have a secret weapon to cheat death. When you have a severe accident, brain cells can die within six minutes. The ambulance of tomorrow will not only reach you in time, it will carry a medical revolution that can save your life.
Patient data registered. Alan Dega. Platinum class confirmed. Loss of blood, 35%. I suggest reversible death. Okay. After a severe accident or heart attack, every second brings us closer to death. So wouldn't it be great if one day we could somehow stop the clock? In the future, EMT crews could use a technique called reversible death or suspended animation. They will replace your blood with an ice cold saline solution, dropping your body temperature to below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. At that point, brain and heart activity come to a halt. And that's not the only blood substitute that one day could save your life. Okay, tell me what happened. At Virginia Commonwealth University, anesthesiologist Bruce Spies is testing a radical blood transfusion for trauma victims. Alcohol, drugs, any other problems that we know of? None that we know of. Okay, let's get them on the table. Blood carries the elixir of life, oxygen. Disrupting the blood supply stars the tissues and threatens the brain. About his past history? Tell me more. And how fast we get oxygen to the injured brain is key to the survival of the brain and the ultimate rehabilitation capability of the patients. Whether they can ever walk again, eat, drink, speak, all depends on that early delivery of oxygen. Brain cells can survive only six minutes without oxygen. This is an image of a brain trauma victim. The big hole is dead brain tissue, starved of oxygen. For years, Spies has been searching for the fastest way to restore oxygen to the brain. Red blood cells work too slowly. He's after an oxygen-carrying substitute that's faster. Finally, he has a likely candidate a milky substance full of harmless oil-based particles called fluorocarbons. In brain trauma, we see that there's constriction of the blood vessels and actually stoppage of blood flow. In this example, you can see blood flowing through blood vessels and slowing. At some spots, it actually stops. The fluorocarbon blood substitutes fill in the spaces in between the red cells and can get to parts of the body where there simply is no blood flow. The key is their size. Fluorocarbons are 100th to 1,000th the size of red blood cells. Yet they carry up to three times as much oxygen. For trauma victims of the future, chilled artificial blood could lower core body temperature and create a safe state of suspended animation. By using fluorocarbons as a way to not only cool a patient, but to increase the oxygen delivered to those tissues, we could preserve brain tissue or heart tissue that would otherwise die. With your body stabilized, you can be loaded into an ambulance and flown to a hospital. The ER of the future will be completely different. Non-invasive body scans will allow physicians to search instantly for broken bones and internal injuries. Diagnosis? Suspended animation, no brain activity, abnormal cardiac function, heavy compound fractures, contusion of the spine, paraplegia likely. Not looking good. Okay, let's get started. Insert the sensors. Tiny electrical microstimulators are injected in your leg and attach themselves to your disabled muscles. The sensors will receive wireless signals that reconnect your muscles with your brain, allowing you to walk again. Today, most images of your organs are hours or even days old by the time your doctor sees them. But 50 years from now, physicians will see images in real time, even as they operate.
At the Oregon Health University, Jonathan Lindner is developing a new way to see the body using an unlikely tool, bubbles. Often when we're doing ultrasound of the heart, we're not able to see the detail that we need to make a clinical decision. So what we do is we make ourselves some tiny bubbles. We agitate this liquid, we inject it into the patient's bloodstream, and the bubbles make their way to the heart, and we're able to see with these microbubbles detail that we were not able to see before. Traditional ultrasound shows only the outlines of the heart muscles. Microbubbles light up the entire heart wall and can reveal damaged tissue. The concept is simple. Microbubbles act like tiny bells. When hit by ultrasound waves, they vibrate and emit waves of their own, revealing more detail. During the high pressure peak, they contract. During the low pressure troughs, they expand. And because of that, they essentially ring in the ultrasound field and produce very strong ultrasound signals. Engineering the bubbles is a science unto itself. First, Lindner mixes one of the body's fats with saline and dye. Then, he injects a gas into the liquid, activates a vibrating metal tip, and the bubbles form. In these magnified capillaries, you can see the bubbles flowing. A hundred thousand of them would fit on the head of a pin. In the future, Microbubbles will do much more than produce better pictures. They'll act like guided missiles. Lindner is learning how to attach genes and drugs to the bubbles. And with his colleagues, he's experimenting with a powerful ultrasound beam to deliver drugs to diseased tissue. In order for us to do drug or gene delivery, what we do is we load up the bubbles and then we use high ultrasound energy to pop the bubbles and drive our payload into tissue. So here you see bubbles in an artificial uh, blood vessel and we're going to strike them once with high power ultrasound and essentially destroy them. By bursting the bubbles on command, he's able to deliver drugs to tissue with pinpoint accuracy. The result? Smaller doses and fewer side effects. Microbubbles will change forever how we treat disease and examine the body. What in the world? Next layer. Last time I saw an artificial heart was in 2040. This one's even made a real polymer. Looks like it took a hit. It's tearing near the energy cell. Clear case for a new heart. How's he insured? Platinum. Good for him. I'll need a tissue sample for the new heart before we bring him round. Building a heart from scratch is no longer just a dream. You're gonna open me up. From a few of your own cells, a new heart made by a printer. Fifty years from now, we'll have cures for trauma victims that would seem like miracles today. Your left thigh has been fractured and your hip is dislocated. Two ribs and a second lumbar vertebra are also fractured, but you have a bigger problem. Your artificial heart has fissures. You're gonna open me up? You need a new heart. The print's already in progress. It'll only take another 20 hours. Iris scan identified. Marie Balzac. Status cleared for security zone. Have a nice evening. In this high security area, gene specialists have processed the patient's tissue sample. Now they are using it to print a heart. If your car gets banged up because you're in a car accident, what do you do? You go to the body shop and get a new door or fender. But if you happen to be in that same accident, you could die. Now, consider this. In the United States alone, there are 91,000 patients waiting for an organ transplant. And of them, 18 die every day for an organ that never comes. What we need is a human body shop. And in 50 years' time, 
tissue engineering could change everything. A child today with a defective heart valve has limited options. Valves from animals don't last long, and artificial valves can cause clots. Stephen Jakenhuvel wants to avoid these problems by implanting the world's first heart valve grown exclusively from the body's own tissue. We are moving away from engineering and mechanical replacements and trying to biologize more, to replace foreign materials step by step with the body's own tissue. Jochen Hovel begins with the mold of a child's heart valve. First, he injects a mixture of heart valve cells and protein into the mold. Then, adds a blood clotting agent and other ingredients. Together, they bond like a super glue. Within an hour, he has the rough form of a heart valve, which he places in a bioreactor. Next, he adds nutrients and cells which normally line heart valve walls. The cells latch onto the structure and start to grow. Within just three weeks, a complete heart valve has formed. Finally, a pump exercises the valve to strengthen its walls so it can withstand the high pressures in a human heart. Jakenhuvel believes that within 10 years, his heart valves will beat within a human body. But valves are just the start. The holy grail of tissue engineering is to grow entire organs from scratch, like the heart. At Clemson University, Researchers believe the key may lie with an unexpected everyday machine. We didn't change much, first of all. Um, this is a conventional inkjet printer, and so what we do is we change the cartridge quite a lot. We take the ink out, we'll modify it so it can accommodate our cells. We rinse it and so on, and sterilize it as well. To test the precision of his modified printer, Bolin first fills the ink cartridge with bacterial cells. Instead of paper, he prints on a very thin biogel. Bolin types out a name, hits print, and the machine springs into action. The cells appear to land in precisely the correct place. But will they live? After incubating them for six hours, the researchers check. The green light is just the fluorescence of the cells, and that shows basically that we did two things. One is the cells were printed where we wanted them to be printed, and second is the cells divided so they survived the printing process. Next, he tries something much more difficult. Printing layers of actual heart cells in the same spot to build up a three-dimensional structure. Within a minute, he has created the world's first printed heart tissue. But are the cells still alive? They are, and they actually beat just as in a living human heart. What we see here are a couple of layers of heart cells that we printed using our printers. And what we want to do eventually is to print an entire heart. Uh, we may achieve this in 50 years or so, but uh, there are a number of things to overcome. The uh, ability to print capillaries, for example. But if we overcome those obstacles, and I think we will, then this could quite be possible. Two days before Alon's heart transplant, the insurance department reviews his case. Next. Stop. Now, his attempt to hide his late-night partying could backfire. Please include in the record, patient Degas Alain, inconsistent test results. Urine sample from 7.34 a.m. does not match urine sample taken at 12.20 in our hospital. 
Probability of manipulation, 80%. Request detailed check. Groceries, trash, and contents of refrigerator. Suspicion of alcohol. Run. Fifty years from now, a replacement heart is manufactured on a printer. It's over here. In 24 hours, it will beat inside his body. In the future, health insurance could consume almost a quarter of your salary. Can you move your leg? But it provides medical miracles. Okay, Monsieur Degas. Now I'll activate the chip in your head. This single chip will help him walk again. Let's practice some walking. Monsieur Degas? Does a brain chip sound impossible? Think again. Ready? Today, there are hundreds of thousands of patients worldwide who are paralyzed. But in the future, we will have a computer chip that connects the brain directly to an arm or a leg, bypassing the injured spinal cord, and the paralyzed will walk again. Few people have thought as much about how to restore motion to paralyzed patients as John Donahue. For the last 20 years, he has been probing the mysterious signals of the brain. Every movement we make is controlled by brain cells called neurons. They emit millions of spikes of electricity, a storm of neural activity that is the secret language of the brain. Donahue wants to read it. The long-term goal was to see whether we could mathematically decode or translate the brain's language into something that a computer could understand and use. Matthew Nagel is paralyzed from the neck down. In 2004, he offered himself to Donahue for a daring trial. Donahue implanted an array of 100 tiny electrodes into his brain to find out if the area of the brain that controls Matthew's arm still functions. During the surgical procedure, our goal was to put this tiny sensor uh, into the arm area of the motor cortex, the area of the brain where arm signals, arm movement signals are generated. So this tiny platform sat on top of the brain and the electrodes about one millimeter long would then go into the brain to pick up brain signals. So what we had hoped is that we could then record the patterns of brain activity that were still remaining after spinal cord injury and in particular we were interested whether just thinking about moving would allow us drive a computer or other devices. The brain signals were relayed through a cord to a computer. Go on to open the first email which says congrats. It says you are doing a great job. But the second email which states... Incredibly. Within just a few days, he could move a cursor by thought alone. Next, I'm going to paint a circle. This circle was drawn simply by thinking. That's the best circle I can do. The next step for Matthew is to control an entire arm or hand again. But before he can do that, researchers need to learn much more about how the limbs work. That's the job of computer scientist Michael Black. Using reflective markers and video cameras, he is capturing the motion of a hand and analyzing it in a computer. His goal is to learn how the brain controls the hand. To simply open a bottle, your hand uses all 15 joints in the fingers. But to Black's surprise, the brain doesn't control each joint individually. Instead, it seems to take shortcuts. For example, you can't move the joints of your fingers independently. The first and second joint of this index finger move in concert with each other. And what we're searching for is how all the fingers move together in a coordinated fashion. 
to try and uncover the representation the brain might use to move the fingers in that way. If a limited number of commands from the brain can control hand movements, then it may be possible to discover how the brain controls limbs as well. In the future, a brain chip implanted at the base of the skull may transmit the brain's commands to a receiver further down the body, bypassing an injured spinal cord. The receiver then decodes the commands and sends them to the limbs. We're at the beginning of this age of neurotechnology and what I want to see is that we can have a physical repair of the nervous system. And what I mean is that someday you'll be sitting here interviewing someone and they'll be moving their hands, they'll be walking around, they'll be talking and they will tell you that I'm in fact spinal cord injured but I've been repaired by a brain gate chip in my motor areas that have reconnected my arms and my legs and I play sports, I, I live a normal life. In 50 years, brain chips will allow trauma victims to manipulate their limbs but one has gone further. He manipulated his records. Ha ha, my friend. Degas Alain, suspicion of manipulation confirmed. Cancel insurance coverage immediately. Confirm. Degas Alain, cancel insurance coverage immediately. Now when I let go of you, just think of walking. What were you thinking? What? <laughs> Maybe I should come back in a few minutes. What's the problem? The results for your Euro tests before and after the accident don't match up. You manipulated them. I had a few drinks in mind before. I was just trying to keep my premiums down. I'll aunt personal care are refusing to pay a dime. You know what that means. And I. You're not insured. Monsieur Degas, I'm sorry. Treatments for those without premium insurance will be limited but attempting to beat the system could be fatal. In 2057, a patient loses his insurance, loses an operation, and stands to lose his life. Oh no. But another patient's loss could prove his salvation. A patient with premium insurance has died, and now the doctor is taking a risky gamble. Sorry, Shepard. It's after hours, and security is lax in the non-insured ward. Marie, what are you doing here? Everything we do from now on could cost me my job. I'm giving you the insurance tip of a first-class patient. What have you done? He was dead already. There's a way to adjust the machine so that he looks like he's still alive to central monitoring. Are you crazy? What are you going to do with the other guy? Paper, he'll die two days later. I'm going to build the heart to his chip and then operate on mm. Then operate on you as planned tomorrow. Then I'll switch the chips back to insurance that'll look like he died in surgery. What if you get caught? The next morning, Alan arrives in the operating room. His custom printed heart is ready. Now, who have we got here? Jacques Martin, born 4595, 90 kilograms, platinum level. Heart transplant with engineered organ. Can you believe he's 62 years old? He's in good shape, Monsieur Jacques Martin. Concentration, please. Everyone ready? Patient hypertherm. During surgery, doctors won't have to touch the patient. Body temperature 46 degrees. Blood completely replaced with plasma solution. Instead, Surgeons will manipulate a 3D model of the body. Stop. Computer rejecting data. Seems like we've got the wrong patient. Hmm. 
There we go. Piece of junk. No kidding. These virtual images will revolutionize surgery in the next decades. With a click, doctors can switch from a scalpel to a saw. They open the thorax virtually, while robotic arms perform the actual incisions. Are all the main arteries blocked? Yes, you can remove the organ. Fifty years ago, some scientists predicted that robots will push the human out of the operating room. Well, that may never happen because every patient is different. Robots cannot anticipate the unexpected. They cannot adjust to new operating strategies. So for you parents out there, hoping that your kids become doctors, keep on saving money for medical school. In the future, there will be surgeons in the operating room. And it's going to be the human-machine partnership that will perform miracles in the hospital. Robotic surgery will soon transform how we operate on the body. Don't give up. The operating room of the future will be nothing like today's. And the change can't come too soon for doctors in Leipzig, Germany, who perform open heart surgery 3,000 times a year. They need specialized instruments for these risky operations. But today, their tools have reached their limits. The surgeon works with extreme precision, but for modern surgical techniques that's not precise enough. When you're operating inside the patient with long instruments, you need to have millimeter, even sub-millimeter precision. That means we need to develop instruments which are an extension of the surgeon's hand inside the patient's body. Fifty years from now, most surgery will be robotic. In Leipzig, physicians are testing a robotic system that merges man and machine. Using a pig's heart, a surgeon practices a bypass. A control panel transmits his hand movements to these tiny instruments. The robot has three arms. Two perform the surgery, while the third holds two small cameras that provide stereoscopic images. The slim probes can reach where human hands cannot. The surgeon can view an image enlarged up to 30 times, so a large movement of his hands creates a much smaller movement by the robot. And a tremor filter keeps a patient from suffering the effects of a surgeon's shaky hands. In the future, robots wielding scalpels will be so precise they will perform surgery on individual cells. But even with ultra precision, things can still go wrong. If a doctor makes a mistake, the robot will too. What we need is a robot smart enough to know better. And Leipzig engineers are developing such a system. In brain surgery, for example, a doctor first outlines the part of the skull he needs to cut to reach the brain. Next, a camera and infrared sensors track the drill's precise position as it goes to work. Now, every millimeter is critical. Drilling too deep could damage delicate nerves. If the surgeon strays out of the marked area, the drill stops before damage is done. Think of it as an emergency break for doctors. But the ultimate in robotic surgery will be telesurgery on a patient hundreds or thousands of miles away, such as on a battlefield. A trauma pod will pick a wounded soldier up. A CT scanner will image the body. A doctor on another continent will be able to administer anesthesia. Then, guide a team of surgical robots to remove the metal fragment. 
cauterize the bleeding, and close the wound with surgical glue. The best surgeons will be able to treat people wherever help is needed. We assume that the surgeon will continue to play the most important role in the operating room. But robots and computers will support the surgeon so that he is more efficient. And operations will be possible, which we can't even imagine today. Alon's custom printed heart is now in his chest. We're running out of time. The fiber and glue will harden in five seconds. Fiber and glue solid. Okay. Unblock the main arteries. All open. Can I revascularize him? Yes. Inject his own blood. Quickly, please. Injecting. 2.5 liters per minute. Two channels. seconds left. Come back. Blood pressure okay? I'll stabilize him. Please close the thorax. If I can afford all these high-tech treatments, I personally wouldn't mind living to be the ripe old age of 200 years to see beyond my years, to see the future of the human race. And how about you? Well, one thing we know for sure, hold on to your hats, because in the next 50 years, it's going to be a wild ride. A super digital wired world. Holographic companions. Personal robots. How will fully networked cities of the future change your world? 2057 continues next with the city. Want a taste of life in the city of the future? Or hear more from futurist Michio Kaku? Go to discovery.com slash 2057. Interact in the future zone.